ladies and gentlemen. It's my uh, pleasure to be here in Dublin and um, to have the opportunity to talk to you about the French-European policy in a very specific uh, context. Uh, because as you know, we are going to have a new president, or at least we are going to have a presidential election, and you're going to have uh, a referendum. And obviously, uh, both events are deeply related, uh, at least from a Irish uh, perspective. And it is the expression of the existence of Europe since an event taking place uh, in uh, one country, France, is, may affect the outcome of a referendum taking place in uh, Ireland. So, if we start with the, the forecast, not of the weather, but the political weather in France, uh, the chances for Mr. Uh, Hollande to win are quite good, uh, or very good, if you're optimistic. Uh, the margin it was probably going to be large uh, because uh, both rounds are deeply related in French elections, even if some people tend to say that they are totally uh, non-related. Uh, uh, so we can reasonably think that Mr. Sarkozy will be outvoted next week by, uh, and Mr. Hollande would be the next uh, French uh, president. So, uh, if we assume that Mr. Hollande would be elected, uh, what are going to be the implication of his election on a French uh, European uh, policy? So, before answering this uh, question in a direct way, let me just make a certain number of remarks concerning the French European policy in general, because you cannot, we cannot reasonably understand what Mr. Hollande may do or, or do not if we do not have in mind the, the context in which this policy is taking place. The first element uh, is that there is obviously a, a strong continuity in French European policy since 1957, independently from political <coughs> changes which uh, took place. General de Gaulle opposed the Treaty of Rome, but at the end, after he came into power in 1958, implemented it. Uh, when Mitterrand entered into office in 1981, he had obviously a pro-European personal background, but he had on his side the communists who were staunchly opposed to, to Europe. And all his initial choices, economic and social choices, were in a sense conducted against the, the trend and the constraints existing in Europe. And there was a, a, two, a, a debate, an intense national debate, or political debate, which took place in 1983, where the choice was between uh, having a kind of nationalist approach to economic problems and not taking into account the European constraints, and those who uh, argued that it would be a political suicide and that the, the future of France lies in, uh, in Europe. And at the end, the choice which had been made in 1983 was definitely on a pro-European choice, which costed, uh, of, had a cost for uh, the government, uh, but the choice had been made in favor of, uh, of, uh, of Europe. Uh, the period uh, which came after this uh, intense debate was a, an interesting period because uh, Jacques Delors, who was at that time Minister of Finance, was appointed uh, at, the, at the commission. And of course, the period between 1985 and 1991, 
uh, was a golden period uh, for France and for, for Europe uh, because uh, there was this kind of uh, trio uh, made of Mitterrand, uh, Cole, and, uh, and, and, and Jacques Delors. Uh, this had obviously uh, an important implication when the Maastricht Treaty was uh, submitted to a, an Irish uh, very well-known habit in Ireland, which consists in putting in the, uh, the treaty uh, in a referendum. And uh, the Maastricht Treaty was, in a sense, a watershed. Uh, it was a watershed in a sense that, for the first time, the European issues became strongly related with the internal political debate. Okay? Uh, so people realized for the first time that Europe was part of their everyday life. It has implication on their everyday life. And it was deeply connected with the internal debate. At that time, the uh, stake was sovereignty. Do we accept a common currency? So do we accept the idea of sharing our sovereignty? And a pattern, uh, a political pattern appeared, and which still exists in France, but not only in France, uh, between political forces, in a sense that Europe divided both right and left. Uh, the Maastricht Treaty, the yes won, but very narrowly, and thanks to the commitment of uh, Mitterrand. And obviously the left was on the side of the president, and the right was deeply divided between elites, uh, who were themselves actually divided, uh, and the population, and the rank and, the rank and file. Uh, so on that time, during the Maastricht Treaty, uh, you had based, roughly speaking, the, a no vote which came from the right and the yes vote which came from the left, okay? Uh, so the second time, uh, the European uh, debate reappeared in the, in the national context was the debate uh, before the ratification of the Amsterdam uh, Treaty. And the Amsterdam Treaty is, of course, uh, very interesting to analyze because it enshrined the famous uh, stability, uh, the Stability Pact. And at that time, a debate took place in France, and there were general elections in 1997, and at that time, the left said that they would not ratify the Amsterdam Treaty if there, is, there would be a no reference to growth, which uh, is a, an interesting reminder uh, for the, the present debate. Uh, at the end, uh, because of the cohabitation between the president who was Jacques Chirac on that time and the prime minister who was Jospin, a compromise was found and uh, the uh, stability pact became the, the growth and stability pact, which was a formal lip service paid to growth, but uh, it was enough for the left to uh, show to its constituency that the promise of having a growth component in the pact would be uh, included. Um, 
the Amsterdam uh, Treaty uh, opened a, an era in which Europe became more and more important in the political debate. But the, the debate shift from traditional sovereignty issues, as it was in the Maastricht Treaty, to, I would say, the social content of Europe. Okay? And of obviously, all this idea of growth uh, versus stability started in 1997. And the realignment, the political realignments following this uh, uh, this, this treaty uh, were significant in a sense that the left became uh, to be much more uh, skeptical uh, or critical towards, uh, towards Europe uh, for uh, precisely it's let's, because Europe was regarded as a kind of neoliberal adventure, which may potentially destroy the French social uh, model. So this rising tension, which had been limited because the, the end of the 90s were a period of high growth, uh, this tension uh, between the, the European project and the French model uh, reappeared uh, a few years later, with the debate on the constitutional treaty. Uh, with here again a referendum, which, as you know, led to, to the victory of the no in France and uh, Netherlands. The, con the constitutional treaty uh, revealed the fracture line between elites and favored social groups on one side, and lower uh, in classes on the other side, uh, with a divide uh, within the right and within the left. So what was foreseeable uh, 10 years ago had been clearly revealed. And the best illustration of this was that the Socialist Party in 2009 endorsed officially the constitutional treaty, but the majority of the electorate from the left voted against. And the no in 2005 was a left, a, a no coming massively from the left. Uh, whereas in Maastricht, the, the no came from the right. Uh, for, and for two reasons. The first is that the debate shifted from sovereignty to social issues. So uh, we have a, a French right, which is uh, I mean, not a liberal right, um, and who has a traditional constituency attached, at least historically, to national sovereignty. So which explain why it was massively against the Maastricht Treaty. But of course, there is another internal reason, is that, roughly speaking, when the referendum is uh, proposed to French citizen by a French gov a rightist government, the right tend to vote in favor of the treaty and support the government, and the reverse is right for the, for the left. In other words, people always answer to other questions. And that obviously it's not spe I mean, specific to the French, but to the nature of the exercise. Um, so this, however, uh, the, the fracture revealed uh, in 2005 uh, became extremely uh, serious and was a source of concern for the left. Uh, because it realized that its constituency, its political basis, was becoming more and more critical toward Europe. And 
That is why, from 2005 onwards, the left shifted toward a more critical approach vis-a-vis -vis Europe and a more leftist approach vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, let's say, social issues and a much more uh, strong opposition to uh, neoliberalism, uh, which was regarded as uh, the culprit of the problems in, um, in, in, in France. Uh, this um, picture was, uh, in a sense, blurred by uh, the rise of the far right, which was from the beginning an anti-European uh, uh, force, which was a concern for both the right and the left. For the right, because of course, uh, it limited the political influence of the right, by definition. Uh, but also for the left, because many of the argument made by the far right vis-a-vis -vis Europe, criticism against Europe, were largely endorsed by uh, the average uh, left uh, voter. Uh, and vis-a-vis uh, -vis Europe, the anti-European uh, approach, uh, I mean, there are no significant differences between the uh, criticism from the right and the criticism from the left, excepted on identity issues. Uh, and the criticism of the neoliberal movement uh, in Europe is massively rejected, both on the right and the left. Uh, the main difference lies in the relation to, let's say, immigration and identity. And that is why you, and you have the same pattern, which had been reproduced uh, during the first round of the French presidential election between the Front Gauche, which is the left uh, front, which has, was on the left of the, the Socialist Party, and the far right. I mean, their opposition to neoliberalism, to Europe, and things like that were basically the same. Uh, I mean, advocating a strong state with strong public services and so on. Uh, but, of course, a, 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 a difference uh, regarding uh, immigration and uh, identity. Now, the mainstream left the, from the left and the right remains committed to, to Europe with uh, no significant differences. Uh, no significant differences. And that's bringing me back to the idea of continuity uh, between the right and, uh, the, and the left. And the, the, the major common point to the right and the left vis-a-vis -vis Europe is a strong endorsement for a strong Europe, including at a global level, Europe as a power, what we call l'Europe puissance, uh, but also a desire and a common desire to limit the influence of European institutions. So strong Europe with weak institutions, that defines the French uh, traditional uh, approach vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, vis -vis, vis -vis Europe. And there was no significant alteration of this. And uh, Mr. Sarkozy and was the perfect and the best advocate of this exacerbated intergovernmental approach and uh, with the creation of the famous directoire, which, which was called Mercosi, uh, which sidelined the European institutions and sidelined the other European countries who didn't see favorably this uh, um, special relationship. So, which brings me to a second point, which concerns the uh, Franco-German relationship, which is regarded as crucial by the right and the left. Uh, when Mr. Sarkozy was elected in 2007, 
he starts saying, or before his election, that he will try to rebalance the Franco-German relation with the Brits, for example. And uh, he used to say that we cannot carry on this policy of having uh, Germany as our only partner. And he used to say, I mean, are you going to spend your holidays in Germany? So, uh, but it was an attempt to introduce a rupture, as he called it, with his predecessor. So, uh, but the reality it, it was uh, things worked uh, very differently because the relationship had been, in a sense, uh, uh, reinforced. But the reinforcement of the Franco-German axis or relation uh, obviously doesn't mean that French and Germany agree. And basically, they disagree. And they tend to more and more disagree on many issues. So why do they disagree whereas they maintain this kind of directoire, which had been illustrated by the famous Deauville uh, summit. The reason is that the Germans are in a position of strength. And the main change which occurred during the last five years, at least, was a, the evolution of the balance of power between France and Germany. This relation is more unbalanced than previously because of the weakening position, economic position of France, and the strongest position, the stronger position of the German economy. So both economies are not at the same, are not on the same playing field. Uh, the Germans are in a better position <coughs> in employment, trade growth, uh, social, uh, um, let's say, consensus, which is much higher than it is in France. And the position of France had been weakened. So why this relation works to a, to a certain extent? On the German side, the reason is simple. The Germans cannot afford to be isolated in Europe. They are largely isolated. But without the French consent, they would be totally isolated. So they absolutely need the support of the French to convey a German message, which is rebranded as a European message. So it's a very convenient ally uh, for uh, Germany. So Mrs. Merkel had resisted all uh, proposals made by Mr. Sarkozy on many fronts, but made a certain number of concessions, including in the fiscal pact, in regard to the uh, Court of Justice and the automaticity of sanctions. Uh, even the non-conventional uh, measures uh, monetary, uh, uh, of monetary policy conducted by the ECB uh, were the result, the partial result at least, of a strong uh, French uh, lobbying. So the reason why the, the Germans are, uh, I mean, still believe and still want to have this core alliance is related to the desire of uh, not being isolated. But there is, on the French side, uh, the alliance with Germany is very useful because it helps France to be at the core of, of Europe. Okay? So the core of the decision-making process. And the Mercosi uh, I mean, is the expression of that. So we are the core, we are the center of the game without being in a position to be equals. Or in other words, we are equalizing our political influence in this uh, directoire in spite of a weakened economic position. And that is a traditional French pattern 
aiming at using political creativity to compensate economic weakness in our relationship with the Germans. But there is a paradox in the evolution of the couple because the Germans actually, uh, under Ms. Merkel, became closer, much closer, to the French on a fundamental point, which is intergovernmentalism. Traditionally, the division between the French and the German was that the French were un uh, I mean, intergovernmental and the Germans were federalist. But it's no more the case. And if you read the famous uh, speech given by Ms. Uh, Merkel in, in Bruges, uh, it reveals what she called the union method, which is different from the uh, communi uh, community method, and which is actually the endorsement of an intergovernmental approach. So the Germans, and that, that is a paradox, are becoming more and more on the French line, not because they are uh, following the French or they are influenced by the French, but because they are realizing that, uh, in a sense, they are more isolated, they were to maintain their position of strength, and that a, an intergovernmental approach uh, is the best way to enhance their uh, position. And the management of the crisis was for the Germans, in a sense, uh, a good, I mean, they, they, have, they can be satisfied from their point of view with the, the way they uh, carried their own interest and their own messages through the Franco-German uh, uh, relationship. Now, what Mr. Hollande may change or not? Uh, undoubtedly, uh, I mean, there's no doubt that Mr. Hollande will remain strongly attached to a strong Franco-German relationship. It is part of the French DNA uh, since 1957. Um, and uh, there is no reasonable alternative to that. Uh, for France in, uh, in Europe. But obviously, uh, the fiscal compact has, in a sense, uh, created a new uh, situation uh, because uh, Mr. Hollande said that he will renegotiate the fiscal compact because the growth component uh, is uh, terribly missing and that austerity is obviously not sufficient to bring a sustainable uh, solution to uh, overcome the European uh, crisis. And obviously, Mr. Hollande is have in mind to take advantage of the election to say to Ms. Merkel that I am invested with a new political legitimacy that you need to take into account. Uh, Mr. Sarkozy was a lame duck. So is no more influence. And the second factor, which is playing in his favor, is the European context. Because obviously, all other leaders in Europe, independently from their political inclination, are waiting for a French signal to increase the pressure on Germany in order to rebalance the fiscal compact. Uh, because politically, it seems that this approach is not sustainable. And what we saw recently in Holland, not in Hollande, but in Holland, 
shows that there is a problem. There is a political problem of social acceptability. So how to uh, maintain uh, a fiscal compact or to reconcile free fiscal compact with uh, growth. So the first thing, and I would like to insist on that, uh, I mean, Mr. Hollande is definitely supporting the, fis the, the, the content of the fiscal pact. So the, the fiscal discipline is not put into question. So that is a fundamental uh, uh, point. So even when Mr. Hollande uh, talked about renegotiating the treaty, I mean, it doesn't mean that he's not supporting the fiscal compact as such. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure that he will be able to renegotiate the treaty because it would open a Pandora box and the Germans are strongly opposed. But, I mean, political creativity uh, is uh, without borders, and there are different ways of dealing with the issues without renegotiating formally the treaty. So uh, in this perspective, uh, Francois Hollande made uh, four proposals. Uh, the first is uh, the creation of project bonds. Uh, which are not euro bonds. And this is, of course, important. Uh, he dropped two uh, initial propositions he made in his program, which are the most difficult uh, proposals for the Germans, and which are basically unacceptable, at least for the moment, for the Germans. One was the creation of euro bonds. And the second was the uh, transformation of the ESM into a bank, which could uh, apply for loans at the ECB. So he dropped those two uh, propositions and made four proposals. The first is project bonds, which aims at raising money in Europe for financing uh, projects. The second uh, aims at recapitalizing the European Bank of uh, Investment for the same purpose. The third is the use of undisbursed funds in Europe, structural funds. And the fourth is a tax on fiscal transactions. Uh, if you look at those four uh, proposals, I mean, they are reasonable uh, in a sense that they are already on the European table. So none of those proposals is original. But the fact that they are, they have been floated in Europe increase the chance for Mr. Hollande to get something. So it's not a radical change. And none of those uh, four uh, propositions are a non-starter for the Germans. Um, the use of undisbursed funds is, uh, had been proposed even by the, the Commission. The tax on fiscal transaction is supported by the, the Commission. But the, of course, the, the, re the repetition of the gains uh, varies according to the different proposals. The recapitalization of the uh, Bank of Investment is not a source of concern. And the uh, project bonds uh, appears like a second best compared to the uh, euro, uh, euro bonds. Um, Mr. Hollande, got recently the support of the governor of the European Central Bank, who referred specifically to a growth pact. But Merkel, yesterday, uh, who 
probably understood the political dynamic which was taking place in Europe with the French election, uh, reaffirmed that there was no position uh, between uh, austerity or, and uh, growth, and that she endorsed the uh, idea of a growth pact. The problem, of course, is uh, the meaning and the content of the growth pact. And here, you have obviously uh, different uh, perspectives on the growth pact. Uh, for Mr. Hollande, at least at this stage, at the political stage in which he is now, uh, the growth pact is regarded or assimilated to a stimulus package to the different uh, proposal he made. Uh, in the German mind, or even in Mr. Draghi's mind, a growth pact means something different, which doesn't mean that it excludes those proposals, but it contains some much more sensitive issues, such as reform labor in European countries, uh, reduction of the perimeter of the state, in the case of France, uh, which is a, an important uh, issue. And um, even if um, Mr. Hollande is obviously supported by other Europeans, including Mr. Monti, but Mr. Monti is conducting a policy in Italy aiming at both stimulating the economy and reforming the country. He has decided to put an end in Italy to the prefectures which had been instituted by Napoleon when he occupied uh, Italy. So uh, that is, for example, uh, something which could be done in France quite easily, but politically very difficult to, uh, to reach. So as a clever politician, uh, Mr. Uh, Hollande is is perfectly aware of those differences, and he explicitly in his press conference refers to the different definitions of a growth pact, but obviously he will concentrate on uh, the stimulus uh, dimension, and we may expect a hope that once this achieved, he moved toward internal reform, which are obviously indispensable for a full uh, recovery in, uh, in, in France. So I, I, I guess that I can stop here. Thank you very much.